Chapter 9, Fears Multiplied Mayo Kolo I have never been a fan of the forests. When I was not in school, I usually visited Kino in his family's cottage after running errands for my grandmother. Inside the forest, I feel like creatures of the night lurked everywhere in the darkness, scheming to grab me with their long fingers. My playful mind tells me that should these vile creatures chase me and catch me, they would laugh their heads off and scare me. By then, I would shiver and wish for my dog Brew to be with me. At least he could bite the nasties of the night away, whatever they were. Tonight was something I did not expect. Piper's hand was holding mine tightly, and I could see through my entire body, how did this happen? I wanted to shrivel and die that moment, itching to see my body again. Instead, the darkness that enveloped us seeped through my body, adding to my fear. If I had better power, one that had nothing to do with food or nasty ingredients, something that I could be proud of, then maybe I would not be as scared. Kino thought that having no power was a bummer, but he is so trapped in his shell that he never once stopped to imagine what it must feel like to have power and yet find it repulsive. To be the laughing stock of the class. Well, my schooling would soon pass, and I would need not deal with the bullying anymore, after I enlist as a palace soldier, which has always been my lifelong dream. I was hoping to be a general like my father someday. And although I barely saw him, it did not matter. When we are presented to the Canellan Palace during the Akeen Wine Festival, I might bump into him, though he may avoid my eyes and deny me as his own son. And this is all because of this stupid power that I have. As for Kino, I like him very much. He is a good child to his mother. Kind and brilliant. But more importantly, he never stood out because he was as much of a wallflower as I was. If Kino believed that I only befriended him because I felt sorry for him, well, he is in for a surprise, because I befriended him out of feeling sorry for myself. My deep thoughts were suddenly disturbed when I stumbled upon a rock and slipped, pulling Piper down with me. Oh, goodness. She shrieked. Even in my invisible state, I felt my cheeks grow hot in embarrassment. I'm sorry, I said as Kino helped us up. Piper did not utter a word but instead focused on the trail ahead of us. She said it was still a long way, and there was no reason why I should not believe her. The ghost town was her hometown. I felt another wave of shivers course through my body because of this, and I had to fight the queasiness of my stomach. We were back to walking again, and this time, I took extra care not to slip on anything. This did not do well for a first impression. Earlier, when I thought Piper was a ghost, I shrieked like a girl. But anyone would have done the same, right? That does not make me a coward, right? After a few more paces, Piper slowed down, and I was glad she did. I was trying hard not to pant so loudly, and it was such an effort because I had been trying to catch my breath from the time we started walking so briskly. She pulled us to a stop and dropped my hand. Piper looked up at Kino. We are several yards away from Nivadin. I'm going to leave you here. I'm taking Mayo first, she said. Kino looked at me, perhaps wondering if I was all right with the plan. When I did not argue, Kino nodded. They were a funny sight. Kino was so tall, and Piper was so short that their heads were exactly a foot apart. Piper tugged at my hand. Let's go, Mayo. Please watch your step. We're going to be invisible again. We walked away, and then she looked back. Please hide, Kino. I'll come for you, she said. Her voice was so soft, but in my heart, it rang truer than any promise made by an adult. Piper lied. We walked another mile, and that was after she said we were only a few yards away from her home, like thrice. She raised my hopes, making me believe that we were close to Nivadin, and that I would be able to eat soon. She never mentioned anything about food the entire trip, but she could not be so cruel, could she? She would feed us eventually, or she would not have insisted on taking us with her, right? It took a few more paces before I saw Nivadin, and I was left in awe. It felt festive here because all around, the trees were lit up brightly. They blinked with lights too, no, wait a minute, it was not the trees. There were tree houses. And they were lit from the inside. 
and then I stopped in my tracks. There, about a hundred yards from where I was, stood several Naramis for trees. Piper tugged at my hand. Keep going, she said. I couldn't take my eyes off the Naramis for trees. They were also glowing bright orange. Their leaves would have been perfect for Kino's pretend wings. Piper tugged at my hand again, and I was forced to move forward. From afar, it looked as if the houses were sparkling with fireflies, a million fireflies, perhaps. The town was generally silent, and a few lights went off, which could only mean that people were starting to turn in. It's still not too late in the night, but we turn the lights off early in case some wanderers brave this side of the mountains. You see, this is all part of the act, she paused and stayed quiet, but I understood. I still got the creeps, though, every time I remembered that the ghosts were actually Akeens. How would I ever look at one of them without having to think that they were ghosts? Piper stopped and looked up at a tree. This is our house. Can you climb? How could Piper expect someone my size to dangle from tree to tree? It was plain silly. Of course, I could not. Just when I thought that resting was within grasp, she had to take it away from me. Again. I grunted, shaking my head. Okay. Ladder it is, then. Hold my waist while I bring it down, she said. It was no fun to watch her, though, because there was nothing to watch. All I knew was that I was holding her waist, and the craddy ropes were moving in front of me. I shivered again. I hoped Piper was the one working the ropes, or I would not be able to hold in a shriek. The ladder swayed in front of us. Come on, she said. Keep your hand on my ankle as we go up. I wanted to thump her on the head for making me climb, but I was so hungry that I wanted to check their dining table and skip the thumping part. So with a growling stomach, I grabbed the ladder and pulled myself up. I focused on holding her ankle as I climbed. It was a difficult feat, and I decided to let go of her ankle in the end. Immediately, my body showed. Piper panicked. She grabbed my arm and made me invisible as she hauled me upwards over the last step of the ladder. Ouch! I said. Keep quiet, Piper said. Didn't I tell you to keep yourself hidden? I rubbed my sore arm as I followed Piper inside the house. Father? She asked. Nobody answered. She tugged at my hand, and we moved carefully into a room at the far end of the house. She opened the door, and we went inside. I exhaled as she let go of my hand. I could tell that she was just as tense as we tiptoed to her room. Stay here. You may lie down in my bed, but cover yourself with a blanket, she said. I don't know where my father is, but chances are he will return late from a town meeting. Perhaps in an hour? She said with uncertainty. I nodded. I'll go back to Kino now. Stay here, she said, vanishing into thin air and leaving me before I could say another word. You forgot the food, I wanted to shout at her. My stomach growled in agreement with me. I was starving. But just then, I heard some babies crying from outside the hut, and my heart started pumping in fear. It's just invisible niven babies, I told myself. I curled up on Piper's bed and hid under the blanket, just to be sure.